All right, so uh, first of all, thank you so much to the organizers uh, for organizing the conference and also the program. It's uh, really been a pleasure to be here and uh, it's a great opportunity to meet you all in person and uh, to share with you some of the things that I've been working on. Um, since the title of my talk is the size of an abstract, I'm gonna start with unpacking that a bit. Um, what do I mean by engineering fluctuation phenomena in nanoscale quantum systems? So here's a typical looking quantum system where you have some atoms or solid state emitters um, that are you know, in some nice quantum state uh, at a distance of few to few hundreds of nanometers away from some microscopic body, which could be the surface of a chip or a waveguide or some resonator. And as these two objects interact, via the quantum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field, uh, we get all sorts of interesting fluctuation phenomena, forces, uh, dissipation, and decoherence of the quantum system that we would like to be able to control and engineer, okay? And um, as a specific example of uh, what, how to do that, uh, I'm going to talk about collective effects in gasimer polder forces. So here, for example, uh, if we consider a system of n two-level atoms prepared in a collective quantum state, uh, as these atoms interact with the fluctuations of the field uh, and they experience a gasimer polder force, uh, what we can ask is, does the collective nature of these atomic dipoles affect the total force? Uh, and the answer, of course, is yes. Uh, and I'll tell you the uh, details as, as we go. All right, so here is an outline of what is to come. Uh, I'll start with some background and motivation uh, from an open quantum systems perspective and uh, tell you about collective effects in Casimir polder forces. And uh, in, uh, at the end, I wanna talk briefly about something which is a bit of a stretch from nanoscales, literally, where we consider this problem of collective fluctuation phenomena between emitters that are at very, very long distances, okay? And what we find there that uh, collective spontaneous emission uh, can be enhanced beyond regular super radiance, and this is an effect that we've been referring to as super duper radiance, okay? <laughs> All right, so I wanna start with a uh, quantum optics motivation to the problem of why do we want to engineer casimir polder interactions in nanoscale systems. So in quantum optics, we are of course interested in uh, making strong interactions between atoms and photons, which are inherently weak, and to improve the efficiency of our quantum optical processes, what we typically do is we confine our fields in smaller and smaller regions, okay? <clears throat> And this brings us to uh, a variety of nanoscale quantum optical systems that provide very tunable and very efficient light matter interactions. So what I've drawn here are just some uh, theorist cartoons, but of course, these systems are not just theoretical, they're uh, very much realized in experiments all over the place. And uh, you can see in some cases, they're also realized by the butterfly community. Um, and they're also being utilized for various applications uh, from building photonic devices to sensing gravitational fields and whatnot. <clears throat> and uh, from a more practical perspective, you can also uh, you know, think that uh, when you walk into a typical quantum optics lab, it looks something like this, which is basically a jungle of big bulky optical elements and what we would ideally like to do is to shrink things down to the size of a chip. And as we do so, we run into casimir polder interactions uh, at nanoscales where uh, the fluctuation phenomena affect how we trap our atoms, how our atoms decay and decohere. And so they're mostly a nuisance that we would like to be able to manage and mitigate. And, um, and to think about how one can do that, we can take an open quantum systems perspective where uh, our quantum system is the system of interest, which is interacting with the 
electromagnetic field as the bath, and the density of modes of the bath is modified uh, in the presence of the boundary condition. And as the system and the bath interact, we get all these uh, fluctuation effects. And uh, in, in this picture, we can see how to modify a fluctuation phenomena, for example, by changing the density of modes of the bath, by <clears throat> changing the surface optical and material properties or its geometry. Um, we can modify the system bath coupling more directly, for example, by using magnetic interactions. We can drive the system to some interesting non-equilibrium steady state, or uh, we can use correlations within the system uh, to modify the overall fluctuation effect. And that's the idea that I'm gonna focus on today. And this is by no means an exhaustive list of the number of things one can do uh, to modify fluctuation effects. And in the meeting, we've been discussing many, many ways, uh, but this is just some of the ways that we've looked at the problem of trying to uh, tailor fluctuation phenomena in nanoscale quantum systems. And if you're interested in any of these ideas, I'd be uh, more than happy to chat. And I'm gonna focus uh, for today on this particular problem of collective effects in Casimir polar forces. Okay. Um, so collective effects have been known in the context of spontaneous emission uh, for, for some time, so since 1954. And the basic idea is that if you have N independent emitters <clears throat> that each emits with a rate gamma zero, uh, if you prepare these emitters in a super radiant state, it is possible to enhance the total emission by a factor of n, for example, and you can also prepare these emitters in a subradiant state where you can suppress the emission uh, even down to zero, okay? And now what if we take these atoms in collective states and uh, put them near a surface? Um, we expect that since there is a analogy between Casimir forces and spontaneous emission being the dispersive and dissipative counterparts of each other, there should be collective effects in vacuum forces as well, okay? And that's the intuition that we start with. And uh, we can make this more concrete by writing, <clears throat> by writing a toy model like this, where uh, we have, let's say, N two-level atoms that are uh, equidistant from a surface and equidistant from each other. This can, of course, be generalized. And uh, let's say they are close to some surface and interacting with the vacuum field. And we can look at this from an open uh, systems perspective where the atoms here are our system of interest described by some density matrix rho uh, interacting with the field, uh, which is the bath and the mo density of modes of the bath is modified by the boundary condition. Uh, and the Hamiltonian for the atom and the atom field interaction are given like so uh, in the dipole approximation where D is our atomic dipole operator and E corresponds to the medium assisted electric field which contains the Green's tensor for the, uh, for the surface. And what we can do now, of course, is we can eliminate the environment and uh, this allows us to write a an effective master equation for the dynamics of our system of interest. So this master equation now describes the collective dynamics of, of the atomic system. Um, and it contains two parts, as you can see. So the first part tells me uh, how the energy shifts and forces are modified in the presence of the surface. And the second part is the Lewillian, which tells us how the a surface modifies the dissipation and decoherence of the quantum system, okay? All right, and what we are interested in uh, for now is the uh, forces. So we'll focus on the first part of, of this Nasser equation. Okay, so uh, considering, let's say, a toy example of two atoms, a red atom and a blue atom, uh, we can write the effective Hamiltonian, which looks something like this, where we have some excited state shift on each of these and some ground state shift. And then there's a surface modified 
dipole-dipole interaction. <clears throat> and uh, when we look at the excited and ground state shifts, uh, we know that these come from the typical virtual photon scattering processes where the atoms go up and down, scatter a photon off of the surface, and they look like that. And um, in, ad in addition to this contribution, the excited state also has a resonant contribution, which, uh, which is you know, due to scattering a resonant photon at the transition frequency and reabsorbing that. And if you look at this resonant shift, you can see that this is exactly uh, the dispersive counterpart to the surface modified spontaneous emission. Okay? So this quantifies the intuition that we started with. And uh, now we can look at the more interesting states, which is the super and the subradiant states. And if we, if we write those out more explicitly, they look something like this, where I have, let's say, the blue atom excited in the red ground in a superposition with the blue atom being in ground and the red being excited. And these two atoms can exchange an excitation via the surface. And these two processes can interfere constructively or destructively depending on the sign of this superposition. All right. And this, uh, therefore, leads to a surface-assisted uh, dipole-dipole interaction that can exhibit uh, collective effects. So here we can see more explicitly that this correlation, uh, this, is, this term is affected by the correlations, and the coefficient out front depends on the distance between the atoms and the surface. So as a result, we get collective effects in the Casimir polder force. And moreover, if we, if we look at uh, the surface-assisted dipole-dipole interaction here, we note that this only depends on the resonant frequency response of the surface, so it can be, in principle, tailored using any resonances uh, in, the, in the surface. All right. And uh, we, we can look at the force and the gamma more explicitly, side by side, and we see that the super and the subradiant forces, as well as the gammas, have a plus or a minus sign uh, here and depending on the atomic correlations. And are, the uh, full expressions are, of course, quite analogous. Uh, and these contain, of course, the surface response via the green tensor. And if we focus on the case where the dipoles are coincident with each other, we can see that the superradiant force uh, can be enhanced to twice the resonant uh, force value. And on the other hand, the subradiant force can be made to vanish. Of course, this is an idealization, and this is, you know, not realistic. But, um, um, but you know, a, a lot of approximations will break down if we if we go to that limit. But that's the general trend, anyway. Now we can look at some numbers as well. So here, for example, if we have uh, two atoms uh, with some typical resonance frequency. Uh, that, that are in the sub-wavelength uh, regime uh, away from the surface. And if we make these emitters closer and closer together as in on the x-axis here, so we can see that as they get closer, they are, uh, and if they're prepared in a superradiant state, there's an enhancement in gamma as well as the Casimir attraction at the same time, okay? And uh, we can also look at the subradiant state of these emitters. And what we note is that uh, we have both a suppression in gamma as well as the force, as the attractive force. So uh, such a state is long-lived as well as uh, it avoids the undesirable Casimir attraction. So this could be potentially useful for trapping particles near surfaces. And we can look at this a bit more explicitly here. What I've drawn is you know, the x-axis and the z-axis. So if I have a pair of emitters that are, let's say, a couple of nanometers from each other and at a distance of 10 nanometers from the surface, it is possible to suppress the force as well as the gamma by roughly a factor of 100. <clears throat> okay. And uh, this may look familiar, but I swear this is not plagiarized from uh, Fernando and Ricardo's talks. 
Uh, so there, there's, for a proof of principle, to look for these effects, one can think of a experiment, let's say, where you have a nano diamond, which is, <clears throat> which has uh, some silicon vacancies embedded in it. And this is if, uh, let's say, we put it on a cantilever and put it near a surface. And if I shine a laser on this and excite these emitters to start with, uh, they start in the excited state and end up in the ground state eventually, as, as you can see on this uh, uh, diagram where we are plotting the level populations in various levels. Uh, so initially you're all in the excited state and eventually you go to the ground state. And in between, you pass through the super radiant state. And as that happens, you can see that there's a boost in the force as you go through the super radiant state. And this boost can potentially uh, be observable in experiments. And particularly if you go to larger number of emitters, uh, it may be possible to observe this because uh, the uh, size of this peak scales with n square. So you can see that, for example, for uh, n equals 10 emitters or so, we get a force that is as large as 50 femtonewtons, which is potentially measurable in the lab. <clears throat> and um, there was also uh, this work uh, from um, uh, some years ago, which showed that, that there is a cooperative enhancement in dipole forces where you can you know, observe 10% increase in trapping strength of uh, such a nano diamond uh, embedded with emitters. And possibly if you take you know, such a system and then put it near a surface, you can also observe uh, a cooperatively enhanced um, Casimir polar force. All right, so to summarize uh, what I've told you so far, uh, we have shown that uh, there are collective effects in Casimir polar forces. And this is something we can understand as an interference in the surface mediated dipole dipole interactions. And potentially super radiant Casimir polar forces could be useful for enhancing and probing uh, otherwise weak vacuum effects. And uh, uh, sub radiant Casimir polar forces could be potentially useful for trapping particles near surfaces. <clears throat> All right, and this brings me to the last part of my talk. Um, so while we were working on this problem, there was a very neat experiment by some of my colleagues at Maryland where they observed uh, super radiance and sub radiance as well uh, in a system of atoms coupled to optical nanofibers. And one of the results in, in this paper was, so of course this was very exciting to me because this is, you know, atoms at 30 nanometers away from, from an optical fiber. So we started discussing this and one of the results in this paper was that if you divide this atomic cloud into two subclouds, <clears throat> uh, then the super radiance behavior doesn't change. So that led them to conclude the title of this paper. And we started thinking about it. That does it really, is, it, is the dipole-dipole interaction uh, really infinite ranged? Um, and this kind of led us uh, down a rabbit hole, which is what I'm going to discuss briefly. How much time do I have? Yeah, I think, I think I can make it. Okay, so, uh, so the idea is roughly the following. So if you consider two emitters that are really, really far apart, and by far I mean the separation between these two atoms is <clears throat> of the order of coherence length of a photon, which is uh, defined as uh, the spontaneous emission rate gamma divided by the uh, velocity of a photon, okay? And uh, you can then define the time scales corresponding to the system relaxation, which is just one over gamma, and the uh, time scale for the correlations in the bath, which is the distance d divided by v. And what happens in these distance regimes is if we compare these two you know, uh, system and vast time scales, <clears throat> what we see is that uh, this dimensionless parameter eta uh, 
tells us that the system can no longer be described within the Markov approximation, meaning that the bath correlations decay uh, not uh, fast enough compared to the system dynamics. And as a result, the system contains memory of its previous dynamics, okay? And we can see within this parameter eta that there are different origins of non-Markovian behavior, for example, coming from strong coupling, or if you have slow bath modes, if you're in a structured reservoir close to a band gap or a band edge. Uh, and in this case, what we observe is non-Markovian effects due to retardation. And um, <clears throat> so what, what we find as a result, so if we consider the case of two, uh, you know, super radiant or just two atoms prepared in a collective state at a distance D, and we can solve the system. And this is what we obtain, uh, particularly for the case of the super radiant state. So here, what I'm plotting is the population in the atoms uh, for different separations between the atoms. Eta is the dimensionless distance parameter as a function of time. So if you see here, the blue line represents the emission from two coincident emitters, which is regular super radiance with two gamma. If the atoms are infinitely far apart, they just emit independently with the rate gamma. But if they're somewhere in between, so for example, if you look at this eta equals 0.5 curve, what you see is that initially they emit independently, but then when they see each other, they realize, aha, we should have been super radiant, and then they kind of overcompensate. So this is you know, where, where you see the faster than super radiant decay, which is more visible here on the log plot. And um, ultra radiance and hyper radiance were taken by other people. So this is kind of what we're stuck with now. And, uh, and right, and we can see, see uh, you know, this from the perspective of the field uh, more interestingly. So here, <clears throat> what I'm plotting is the uh, light cones coming from the atoms. And you can see as the light cone of one atom hits the other, there's an enhancement of the radiation going outwards. And more interestingly, if uh, we look at the case of the subradiant state, you see that as the atoms see each other, they kind of form a bound state. So, the, so this is like a perfect cavity formed by the atoms uh, as the photon bounces back and forth. Okay, so this is a, a cavity made by the atoms, for the atoms, uh, so on. And what we also find uh, eventually is that there is in fact a limit to the dipole-dipole interaction uh, due to retardation effects. So we you know, kind of come back a full circle to answer the question that we started with. And all, all this thanks to a poor choice of title of this paper. Uh, but uh, yeah, so this, this led us to many interesting things and uh, we are now uh, exploring this in an ex extension of the previous experiment where we have two optical nanofibers now coupled via a long fiber, could be tens of meters long, and here we have an atomic cloud which we excite from the side and uh, we are looking for some retardation-induced modifications to collective effects in, in this system. And uh, while we haven't seen those as cleanly as we wanted to, but we found some other things in the meantime. So what we ended up finding instead was uh, that there are collective effects in quantum beats, uh, which we could observe. And, um, and these are vacuum induced quantum beats moreover. So if we have, let's say, a three level atomic system, and if we prepare the system in only one of the excited states, not both, it is still possible to observe quantum beats uh, and they can be, collectively enhanced uh, by uh, uh, the number of atoms that we have in the system. So here is a picture of from that experiment where we get excellent agreement between the theory and the data. So not what we were looking for, but cool nevertheless. Um, so yeah, this has led to several other questions that we've explored and other people have explored. and. Um, uh, I'm curious also to see, you know, what kind of non-Markovian effects can arise in other fluctuation phenomena in, in these retarded regimes. Uh, and with that, I'd like to 
uh, thank you all for your attention and thank my awesome collaborators. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to. Okay, first question. Thanks very much, Kanu. Beautiful talk. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one, you know, when you have these super radiant and sub radiant states, you have two, uh, not only these brightness and darkness of these states, but you also have these two different time scales. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit or comment on how to measure these dark states? I mean, the super radiant mm -hmm. states, you know, because they're very fast. Right, you, can, yeah. you can see them, but they're quick. Yeah, so and so and then, yeah, okay, go ahead, then I'll ask. Okay, so, so the dark state is hard to observe. Uh, you have to wait for very, very long for, for the subradiant state signatures. And uh, the superradiant state, as you said, it, it also preferentially couples to the waveguide. So it's easier to detect that. So um, I guess patience is my answer. <laughs> no, nothing too insightful, but yeah. But even at the weakness, the darkness of the state, can, are there schemes or experiments to specifically measure the subradiant states? Because the, even if you wait a long time, if you only get one photon, you know what I mean? It's, it's a weak state, relatively. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that, actually. So we, we've been, in the, in the current experiment, we've been mostly looking for the superradiant signals because Yes. We know that's the one that preferentially couples to the waveguide. Of course. Mm -hmm. And then my second question was about, um, you, you mentioned the sub-wavelength regime. How would those, if you can go back to the slide where you had KZ is approximately 1.01, uh -huh. what would, how would your results change in the not, when, when you're not in the sub-wavelength regime? When your system uh -huh. size is larger than your excitation? Yeah, there we yeah, go. Yeah, okay. Uh, the effects are weaker in general. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, uh, oh, we, we kind of have that here. So if you can see along the z-axis, oh, this is mostly still in the sub-radiant sub regime, but... Sorry, the sub-wavelength is what I meant. Uh, right, right, right. Uh -huh. Sorry, so, so this is still in the sub-wavelength regime, um, but the effect of <laughs> increasing the z uh, makes the overall suppression less. So there, there is a non-trivial scaling. It's, uh, uh, it's not just, well, there's the overall one over Z cubed, so that makes the effect smaller. But then it, there's also uh, some convolution with X that comes into play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. I have a question about the, the form of the memory kernel. Do you know uh, what is the form of the memory kernel in a normal Kofian ah. effect? Is it uh, exponential, Gaussian, or any other uh, shape? Okay, so in this case, the, the memory kernel is uh, exponential. And we can see that of sorts in the, in the result here. So what we are looking at here is the effective Hamiltonian at the instant where the atoms see each other for the first time. Mm -hmm. And what we find is that the dipole-dipole interaction get a modification due to the bath correlations. And that correlation is this e to the minus, uh, it leads to this exponential correction. Is that exponential? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, can you, uh, really nice talk. Uh, I want to ask whether you consider the higher multiples, uh, quadruples. Um, I remember there was a paper by Marin Suyacic. Uh, they had calculated the uh, emission, uh, the lifetime of those higher mode uh, quadruples on uh, top of graphene surface. Uh -huh. And the conclusion is because I think if I understood it correctly, the high high field uh, on on top of graphene, the those dark, typically dark, say they uh, become a, uh, say their their emission uh, lifetime uh, significantly shortened, so they actually could be uh, see observed. That's their prediction. Uh, uh, that's one 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 reason I ask that. 
I guess the other reason I asked that is uh, like uh, when you do your very near field, let's say near the surface, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I wonder whether those uh, colorful mode, uh, because your field will change rapidly near that region surface uh, in terms of gradient, and uh, whether uh, there's enough uh, change over the dipole distance, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, say your x0 there, that could actually uh, say, uh, uh, have some impact on this force. So I, I have not considered quadruple moments in the calculation, but in the regimes that we are in, the particles are well approximated by dipole approximation still, uh, because these are atoms, right? So if we had a larger particle, then I agree we would need to consider quadruple moments for, for example, for nanospheres and stuff like that. What's but, the typical x zero in your calculation? Ah, uh, yes, no, that that I do not, I do not stand by my word there. So uh, that, that's just an idealization to show that, uh, in principle, if we take x to zero, it is possible to get vanishing forces as well. But that that's just a you know um, ideal version. Are you done? So you made this list of changes due to the surface in the master equation, Hamiltonian energy mm -hmm. shift, change in the lifetime. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about uh, the Lindler jump operators themselves? Uh, I'm calling that decoherent, actually. So the uh, you're referring to, I did not write the Lindbladian, I think, anywhere. But mm. I, yeah. Sorry about that, but uh, yeah, so that is what I'm referring to as decoherence. Um, yeah, okay. That was what I meant by, for the jump term. And so any physics that comes out of that? Um, well, I mean, it, uh, it changes how your uh, recoil is, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing, and how does atomic levels decohere in the, you know, the non-diagonal elements. So that's... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is in the, in the Born-Markov approximation, so it's a time-local mass regression Lindblad form and all. Okay, no question. Can you comment a little bit on the difference between infinite range in this 1D case versus, let's say, 2 and 3D? Oh, good question. Uh, I can't, actually. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, that would be, that would be an interesting uh, thing to consider. Uh, what if there were retardation effects in 2D and 3D geometries? And uh, I, I don't think that's been explored, to my knowledge. More questions? We have another 10 minutes. So when you can see the um, two dipoles mm -hmm. um, next to a wire, mm -hmm. uh, and you look at the collective emission from both of them, they exchange by uh, excitation on a wire, right? Right. So there are uh, two ways for them to, OK, so he, they can only talk to each other through this part, uh, what we are doing is we are shining a laser from the side. Yeah, but uh, the previous picture, uh, it was showing the two dipole emitters close to a wire. Right, uh, right. That, that's this wire. It's, it's, it's this one? Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, so, but does it depend on the distance on the wire, on the spectrum of the wire itself? On, on the... Spectrum of the wire. Yeah, yeah. So we assumed a linear dispersion here, but it would be interesting, of course, to see what is the effect of the dispersion uh, and, and the spectral properties, which, uh, you know, could lead to additional non-Markovian effects that we have not thought about in, in here. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
do you um, couple the atoms in your system besides this uh, delay or retardation effect? But is there uh, suppressed coupling between the atom, the dipoles? We would uh, try to avoid that <laughs> okay. because uh, because the idea is that if we want to, so no, the, the short answer is in the experiment we don't. Mm -hmm. um, but we would like for the only coupling to be through the the delay line, and uh, yeah, but it would be interesting to see. Okay, so you do want to have a shortcut to be able to prepare things in the same uh, in in a collective state. So that's why we have this shared cloud that you can excite from the side, and if you excite it weakly enough, there may be a single photon that is shared you know, among the whole cloud, and then you have one excitation here and one excitation there. And with some probability, you might be able to detect uh, an entangled state or su super radiant emission as a result. Um, but a, in the experiment as it is, there are no additional couplings. Okay, between. so they're not even coulombic. There's no coulombic coupling between the, the we dipoles. We don't the consider that. Okay. Here. It's a dilute enough cloud, so one can safely assume that it's not there. We have time. More questions? Okay. All right. No, it's about uh, 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 the the interactions on the, the uh, to go beyond the dipolar interactions. Uh -huh. Yeah, when the particles are very close. The yeah. quadrupolar polar and the next uh, orders in the expansion are very important. Yeah. And they uh, pro uh, they change the dissipation very much. And True. then the uh, so they contribute to the to the dissipation uh, substantially. And also the fluctuation you, know, you had to define a fluctuation dissipation theorem for each uh, term in the in the expansion. So we published an article in which we precisely did that, right? So to incorporate those, the, the, the multipolar interactions, you need uh, cal to calculate the dissipation mm -hmm. and also the uh, fluctuation dissipation theorem. Yeah, that was my, my comment. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, we still have time. Any comments, questions? <laughs> Well, um, then let's finish. Uh, and in case there's more questions, we can always reach out to Kanu at during dinner, which uh, is supposed to be at 6 o'clock, I think, according to schedule. So thank you all. <laughs>